Welcome to Almost Here, Round the Corner of Future Technology Podcasts with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies poised to transform our lives for better or worse are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used. We're just around the corner from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Head Tech Podcast. Uh, my guest today is Ted Teakin. He's the uh, founder of Keto & Co., uh, a company that provides uh, keto-friendly products for people that uh, want to eat the ketogenic lifestyle and be, be involved in that lifestyle. So, uh, Ted, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, keeping people in food that keeps them keto is uh, is a busy business these days. Well, that's great. So what, what's your background? Why did you even find out about this way of eating and what led you to it? Tell me what happened to you. Sure. So um, I am not a food, sci- food scientist by background. Um, I, uh, I went to Harvard and I studied economic development, um, which food is a really important part of economic development. And I, I would argue that it is the cornerstone technology that all other technologies are built on. Um, but I wasn't in a specific nutrition program. Um, I left there, I went and I did management consulting for about, uh, two and a half years. And then I left consulting because I came down with a chronic pain condition. Um, I couldn't stay put, I had to do something. So I taught myself to write software. Um, I wrote a couple of websites, including one that's still running as a software as a service web, uh, startup. And then in about 2014, on the advice of a friend of mine from college, uh, John Durant, who you might have heard of from the paleo community, um, Mm -hmm. I tried the keto diet and it was kind of a lark. When John first suggested it to me, I was like, there is no bleeping way that diet can measurably affect health outcomes. This is complete bunk. But skeptical of my own skepticism, I said... Hey, John, when I have a chance to run an experiment, uh, this when this one makes it to the top of the experiment list, we'll try it. Um, yeah. And it took about two years after he suggested it that the, finally we had an open experiment slot just due to a scheduling mishap with my pain doctor. And oh. four days later, I wrote him a thank you slash I'm sorry email because oh. my pain had dropped by about half. And I actually felt good. My thinking was clear. My pain was down. And my energy was up. And I was like, what is this thing? And so it was really Mm -hmm. mid-2014 on a super lark that I ended up on the keto diet for myself and started researching it from there. What what was the, I don't know if you want to say, what was the the chronic pain you had? What what was it called or diagnosed as? It's it's a diagnosis of we don't know. It's called fibromyalgia, um, which Uh, uh, some of my doctors lovingly describe it. It is a wastebasket diagnosis where they've ruled out everything they know how it works. And this is what we're left with. So, and that's why I took this very hardcore empiricist approach to, I make a change and I measure it for two months and I see what happens. And then I make another change because if you're dealing with a black box and you don't even really have a good theory of mechanism, it's the only really good way to know if your outcomes are legitimate. Well, it's good you said that because, um, you know, I've, as we've talked about offline, I follow close to a ketogenic diet. I can't get all the way there. It's probably modified Atkins, you could say, low carb, low sugar. Um, but the information out there on how to eat a ketogenic diet, what modifications, and how to tweak it so it works for you, you know, meaning the individual, it, I don't know, it's not very empirical, it seems like. So, what are some learnings you've had over the past few years? Because you've been doing this for a while now, it's, you know, about four years. You're doing yep, this in 2018, four... so you must have uh, done a lot of experiments on yourself. What, what kind of tweaks and things have you learned? Um, well, so I, I think there are broadly two camps in the keto community. There is the whole food keto, and they are more about food lists of this is okay, this isn't okay. And then I, there's the other group that I would call the net carb keto. And that's the camp that I've always fallen into. Um, and that's the camp that I think inherits all of the research that's been done since the early 1900s on pediatric epilepsy used to treat, uh, or sorry, keto used to treat pediatric epilepsy. So the approach I follow, and I'm not going to say that the uh, whole food keto camp is wrong. Uh, it's just not the camp that I'm in. The approach I follow is you've got a budget and you've got 25 grams of carbohydrates. Spend them however you want. 
if you want to eat a teaspoon of white sugar, that's, you know, I think that's 18 grams. Uh, so you've got seven grams left. So I, um, I look at the keto diet as being remarkably straightforward and one of the most empirically testable diets out there. If you eat below a certain level of carbohydrates for at least four days in a row, your body will start making ketone bodies and you can measure those. You can measure the amount of beta-hydroxybutyrate in your blood system. And it's even affordable now um, with affordable ketone test strips that have been on the market for at least about a year. Yeah, the, uh, I guess the Precision Extra was recommended and it does both blood sugar and ketones. And I've used it and, uh, you know, to test my ketone level. And I, my wife did too, and she beat me. She was at like three millimolar <laughs> and I was happy to get to like one and I was really jealous, but uh, it works. Yeah. Yeah, so the Precision Extra is the um, the device I started with. Um, I've been using the Keto Mojo device um, recently because it's targeted at keto and their test strips are uh, a little bit less expensive. Um, but okay. whichever machine you use, you can test your blood ketones and know, you know, are you at one? Are you at five? Are you at zero? And you, it's it's the only diet I know of that has an objective instant blood test to tell you whether you're following it or not. Yeah, one, uh, I guess just one anecdote is I, you know, I, I did blood work, uh, I don't know, a while ago. And, um, you know, I did it like two or three o'clock in the afternoon. And when I went in there, I said to the people, oh, do I need to be fasting for this? And they go, oh my God, were, were you fasting? I said, yeah, I thought, I'm fine though, don't worry. Because I was, because <laughs> I was eating this way and you don't get hungry too often and you can last a long time. And uh, yeah, I did the blood work and all that, but they were like horrified, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, no. And I, um, I, I periodically add intermittent fasting on top of keto for myself just cause I, I feel better. Um, I can't, I can't explain a lot of why keto helps me. Um, I've got a couple of theories for certain parts, intermittent fasting. I've got a couple of theories for, but there's, you know, I, I think keto is interesting because in a couple of ways, the diet's been around for over 100 years, so we've got a long history of medical data, but it's only really specifically against pediatric epilepsy. When we start talking about the diet's potential applications for other diseases, um, outside, I think, weight loss and diabetes, where the evidence is pretty straightforward at this point, um, it's a mathematical solution for diabetes and a certain portion of the population rapidly gets back to a healthy weight. We can't say why it helps, but, um, you know, uh, outside of those named conditions, we really don't know the mechanism by which it's helping, at least not yet. Mm. Yes, yeah, so I, I took you off course a little bit. You said you're in the, um, you look at it as a carb budget and you stick to it, but what, um, what experiments or tweaks, again, have you made over the years where it worked better for you or it didn't work? You know, what are some things you did? You know, it's, um, it's pretty straightforward. I, I actually, so I got my ability to move to the world back in 2014, and I've just been loving being able to move again. And so I've just been doing things. So I really haven't ran or run uh, too many experiments since 2014. If I stay in keto, I feel great. If I drink too much beer, which I don't do very often, but occasionally I get together with my buddies from college and drink too much beer, I kick myself out of keto and I feel like crap for a couple of days. So that's, you know, I, um, I stopped experimenting and I started living in 2014. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have that. I don't have too many more really interesting experiments to share. Um, because, okay. Okay. And I really credit keto with giving me um, a large portion of my life back. Well, tell me about uh, Keto & Co. What's this company about? What's the mission? You know, what do you guys do there? And we'll, we'll take it from that angle. Sure. So uh, late 2014, I'd been following keto for about three months, and I was frustrated with how long it was taking me to make keto foods. Back then, there was really not much that was available. Virtually nobody had heard about it, the diet. And I was looking around trying to figure out, all right, cool, I can move to the world again. What am I going to do next? And uh, you know, I looked at keto and I looked at food and how it's played as a technology for human history and the broken modern food system. And I, and I thought to myself, I'm like, you know, keto could be part of the answer for how we get back to a healthy food supply. Um, it's certainly an answer for people like me, um, and it might be an answer for more people. This is an opportunity to get what I kind of call the millennial trifecta. Um, I'm personally passionate about it. I think it's important to the world and it's potentially profitable or 
we can solve it with the market mechanism of a business. Um, and so I thought, you know, let's see what we can do to make a ketogenic diet low sacrifice, delightful, and well known. And so we started with uh, one shake that um, was suboptimal in about every way possible. Um, and over the years, we've added more products. Some of them work, some of them don't. Um, and so, you know, if you ask about what experiments I've run in the past four years, almost all of them have been product experiments. You know, um, does this blend of oil sell as an alternative to olive oil? What about this combination of flavors in a shake? Um, you know, can we repackage coconut oil? That one failed miserably, actually. Um, but one of the things that that experimentation led us to develop was like a really delightful ultra low carb meal replacement shake that has everything you need and nothing you don't. And that's, um, that's our hero product. Now uh, we recently just rebranded it to be called sated um, because that's what we developed it to do is to be as sating as possible. And so we kind of flipped the script on modern food and instead of making food that is addictive um, and so that we can sell a couple more bags, we said, what if we tried to engineer satiety or that state of like perfect fullness into a shake? Mm. What if we put every satiety element we know of into a shake? Can we give people control back over their calories? And that's really what state it is. Um, we still man maintain the keto and company line of grocery products. So we've got brownies, uh, dry rice, cauliflower, some sweeteners. Uh, we have a flatbread coming out. Um, and so we operate both brands actively, but sated is really the one right now that's taking off. Well, that's a good, good word. You know, you want to eat and feel sated so you don't have to eat again an hour later or, you know, feel uh, be on this uh, roller coaster of up and down starving and over full and tired and, and all that. So, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, <clears throat> You don't have to be keto to get the benefits of all of these levers of satiety that are in our shake. You know, if you reduce your carbohydrates, you get down from this unnaturally high level of insulin and blood sugar that we have in the modern food world. Um, you're going to see benefits. Uh, if you go all the way keto, there's kind of this like step change in benefits. But um, going from 300 grams to 150 grams, there's definitely an improvement for most people. Uh, from having that reduction in their carbohydrates. What would you say is the step change from being, you know, low carb, maybe modified Atkins to keto? So I think it has to do with the specific pathways by which, um, by which glucose is, is about a, I forget exactly how many steps. I think it's something on the order of 20 or 30 steps to enter the Krebs cycle where it then gets mm -hmm. converted into ATP, ADP. Um, and the fat process is only about 12 steps long. So mm. one, uh, each of those steps along the way has a different side effect. You know, it makes aldehyde and that has to be processed throughout the body. So one is, and this is one of the theories that I have for my own condition is that I think my body has trouble with one of the byproducts of the process to turn glucose into something that can enter the Krebs cycle. Um, and it seems like the fat process is fine. Um, that's my personal theory. Um, but the major thing that's going to happen, um, if you're not one of these people where the presence of carbohydrates is a problem, um, is the presence of ketones it has been shown pretty convincingly to affect the hormones that control hunger. So, you know, leptin and ghrelin being the primary ones. And so it's kind of a, a natural appetite suppressant or as it pertains to weight loss, it's a willpower magnifier. So if you could, if your willpower would get you a 200 calorie deficit before, suddenly with keto, for some people, not for everyone, but for some people, you can get an 800 calorie deficit, which leads to faster results, um, even if nothing else in your body was broken before you moved over to it. Okay, makes sense. It would be a real challenge for you is, uh, I don't know if you've had exogenous ketones, which are, they don't taste too good at all. If you can incorporate those into a food and make it taste good, I mean, that's like the billion dollar question to me. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I, uh, lot, but they're like, Bleh, you know, I, uh, I have not played around with exogenous ketones too much. Um, you know, it's, 
I try to limit how many like way out there things we're doing where we're pushing the frontier. Um, and mm. I just, I haven't read enough about exogenous ketones. Plus they really hurt my stomach. Like my stomach is just mm. a disaster zone when we add exogenous ketones. So um, I believe there's a way. Um, and uh, there is one sports shake I've had that was, I, I, I haven't had a lot of ketones, but um, ketone.io, uh, their shake tastes great. Um, it's just the ketones, the, the exogenous ketones don't agree with me. Um, it's just, it's kind of like, a, it's, it's like Gatorade, um, like a slightly fruitier version of Gatorade. So I love the taste of it. I just can't drink it because it doesn't agree with me. Right. It makes sense. It can, it can be hard in your stomach. You're right. So um, uh, uh, of the foods you have, what is the protocol? Are they, um, is it one meal a day replacements or what do you, you know, what's the best way for people to consume your products? Is it just, they learn how to cook products or they supplement with yours or what should they do? So I, um, I, however it fits into their life. Um, you know, I, um, I take the approach that everybody has a good reason to eat the way they eat. And we want to be giving people more tools and better tools. Um, when it comes to our shakes, the majority of people eat them for either breakfast or lunch, um, one or two meals a day. Um, and I think that's a great way to do it. Uh, a couple of people, eat a substantially higher portion of their calories and they're designed such that you can do that. Um, we don't necessarily recommend doing so because for not the least reason, um, steak and green beans and salad is delicious and has a place in um, the social interaction of eating. But, you know, we, we try not to be prescriptive. We, I, I really look at myself as the provider of tools, not as a provider of um, just dictums on how to live your life. Mm. So what do you? So what's your experience? What kind of feedback do you get from clients that uh, consume your foods? How are they doing it? And what kind of surprises have you seen? I'm sure that you assume they would do it one way, and they probably do it a different way. Is my guess? Yeah, no, um, absolutely. And in this like, experimentation, we initially thought people would mix up 2,000 calories of the shake and eat it over one or two days. It turns out that's not at all what people do. What people do is they mix up one shake and they eat it for breakfast. And then if they want one for lunch, they mix up another shake. So the entire form factor optimization that we went with, went live with for our first product was completely wrong. Um, it was hmm. almost the exact worst, um, the exact worst way that we could have packaged the product. Um, and so over time, we listen to customers. We hear what they like, what they dislike. Um, a lot of people really dislike canola oil. Um, I personally think it's fine, but enough people really disliked it that we said, hey, you know, we don't have to have canola oil in here. If these people have a reason for not wanting it, we can still get to the nutritional characteristics we want without it. So let's drop it. Um, and another place where we were surprised by customers, or at least I'm surprised by customers, is in blind taste testing, sucralose comes out, uh, which is a sweetener. It's the one that's in Splenda. Sucralose mm -hmm. comes out as the best tasting of all of them. But when people get to choose, they want natural sweeteners. So we spent a lot of time in the last six months developing a combination of erythritol, monk fruit, stevia, fiber that would work together to get almost as good for the average person as the sucralose format we had before. And we didn't quite get to the average level of, hey, that's just sugar or that's just sweet. But we got close enough and people want it so much that um, it's only been live for a month, but it's already outselling the sucralose version by about 30 percent. Oh, wow. Is it, um, have you studied to see how it uh, affects your, you know, your, your glucose response or your insulin levels? Or is it just people so, like it? It's selling better? That's it. So we, um, we take the approach of if we don't put glucose molecules into the food, um, except for fiber, which has undigestible bonds, so it's not going to create glucose in the bloodstream, you can't have blood glucose. Um, we're in the process of getting glycemic index testing done. Um, in the small anecdotal subset of people that we've talked to, um, it looks like it has a mild, and this is preliminary and this is not verified by a lab yet, but it looks like it has a mild anti-glycemic effect. So um, in the tests we've done, people are either just dead flat or down by one point. Um, so they go from like 72 to 71 over an hour after they consume the shake. But, um, you know, we, we're starting from a safe set of ingredients that we know won't spike blood sugar. So we can have very high confidence that the end result also won't spike blood sugar. 
Yeah, no, that's great. Hmm. What uh, what kind of questions do you get from your you know your your consumers? What do they want to know about, and are you able to answer it, or uh, you know, what other insights have you gotten from them? Um, so, you know, we get we get all of the questions. The majority of the questions we get are uh, to do with the subscription model or how to uh, how to shop through e-commerce. We really um, we really are not selling the diet. What we are doing is we're selling product to people who've chosen to be on a ketogenic diet. And the reason for that is that the amount of resources for counseling that you need to have to responsibly bring people onto a ketogenic diet is pretty substantial. And we're a small mm -hmm. team and we're trying to do a lot when it comes to the food side. And we don't want to be, we don't want to bite off more than we can chew by adding counseling. So um, we, we uh, specifically avoid the counseling. We'll send people to a few resources, um, a couple of blogs that we know, but um, our most common response to like is keto for me is one, you should try it. And two, make sure you talk with your doctor um, because we're not, we're not medical specialists. We're food specialists. And right. um, we've chosen very specifically not to be promoters of the diet yet. Um do you have any sense of how doctors, like, how did, I don't know, how did your doctors react when you said, hey, I'm feeling better on this diet, I don't need you anymore? And has, do you oh. know, have any sense on how other people's doctors respond when they tell them about this diet? I think I, I, I have, um, so I have a chronic pain condition, so I have a, a variety of doctors that I treat with. Um, and I think I have all three typical responses. One, which is, enthusiasm and excitement for the possibility and for forging new ground with nutrition to treat disease. One is like, yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with what I do. And the other is like, look, people try a bunch of crazy stuff when they're faced with chronic pain. Um, you're not a crazy person, but what you're trying is crazy. Um, and so, you know, just with, as with anything, the range of opinions varies. Um, one of my doctors is extremely supportive and one of my doctors is borderline, opposed hmm. okay so i mean there's, there's nothing clear cut out there you would guess uh, other people are probably getting the same responses you know maybe half are like don't do it half or i don't know what to tell you about it just go do whatever you want yeah and it's um you know it's it's really kind of a crapshoot um what kind of a response you're going to get from your doctor what kind of qualifiers they're going to give um, I mean, we, we do know that there are a couple of clinics that are using keto um, kind of, quote unquote, on label. Um, so, you know, Heal Care is using it. Uh, the people at Verda are using it under medical supervision, um, both of which, well, Heal Care is using it to treat, uh, I believe, obesity and diabetes. And I think Verda is specifically using it to treat diabetes. Um, so that we are starting to see credible doctors, credible credible medical institutions using keto to treat some of the most obvious applications of the diet. Um, and I really hope we start to see more in the future uh, because for the people it works for, it's fantastic. It's life-changing. Hmm. What's uh, so where are you taking the foods now? Are you making them more palatable, you know, more enjoyable, keeping that low glycemic response or no, no response. What's next? So, uh, where are you headed? So, um, the first place we're headed is uh, in August, we're doing a uh, pre-sale for a ready-to-drink version of our Sated Shake, um, and we're going to have that on Kickstarter. Um, and we're really excited about that because all of the feedback we've seen from all of our customers over the years is, um, you know, the difference between less than five seconds and 30 seconds to make it, 30 seconds to clean up is... Just, it's enormous in how it can fit into your daily routine. So we're really excited to finally be getting this to the, that bliss format of just twist the top and you're ready. Um, and then on the keto and company side, uh, we've got a, our backlog of products that we're ready to come out with. We've got cupcakes, uh, flatbread, four flavors of our cauliflower rice. Um, we're in active development on pizza crust and a bunch of other things. So um, there's a ton of exciting stuff that's happening, and we're finally starting to get to the size where we have the resources to bring two, three products a month to market where we only could really come out with a product every two to three months before. Well, what are people asking you for? I mean, you're, you're coming out with stuff, which is great, but 
you know, what are the the big uh, foods that you want to conquer? You know, so last year we did a 4,000 person research panel and we asked people if they could wave a magic wand, what food would they make ketogenic? And Mm. some of the top ones are very straightforward. Um, Mashed potatoes, French fries, uh, ice cream, bread, obviously, was the biggest one. Um, And I think rice was number five. So, you know, we're using um, what we see customers asking for in our surveys, um, what I personally miss myself in my life, and where we can find um, a couple of data sets like keto search volume on the Internet. Um, That's what we're using to kind of guide our product development and then always being open to serendipity. So, you know, our dry rice cauliflower, we found by accident while we were trying to make uh, a cauliflower mashed potatoes. (laughs) Cauliflower mashed potatoes were absolutely horrible. They tasted like sand. But the cauliflower rice was perfect. It cooked up just like rice, even easier and um It's one of our better selling products right now. So uh, we use market information, personal information, um, user surveys, and serendipity to help guide our product development. You know what I like is is multiple times during this conversation, you said, we tried this and it failed, or we tried this and it didn't work. And you're like probably, I don't know, one of the very few people I've talked to that uh, is willing to admit when things don't work, which is a good sign. Not that you know, it doesn't say you're worse than anyone or better than anyone, but everyone I'm sure does stuff that doesn't work, but you're one of the few that admits it, which is really good. That's really cool. Well, I like to follow, you know, it's, it's growth mindset or open mindset. Um, I like to follow the adage of the easiest way to always be right is that when you're proven wrong, accept the other person's argument. Um, and we use that uh, really throughout everything we do at the company here where if we're, we know we're going to be wrong about a bunch of stuff, and if we're just honest about what the information is telling us, we can get to right so much faster than if we spend our days trying to prove that we haven't, we've never made a mistake. Because our goal is to be right as often as possible, not to not be wrong as little as possible, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, that's great. So uh, right now you're on the quest to make these dream foods for people, keto style. Um, is that enough or are there other projects you have in the works that you, you know, you want to see uh, happen? So, um, you know, that making keto easy and accessible is, <laughs> it's a really big problem. Um, and we've got at least another three to five years on that. Um, I, I see a problem I want to solve with either a market mechanism or, you know, a better governmental policy probably twice a day. But, um, I take this approach that if you don't focus in and put at least five years behind one problem, you're not going to move the pro- you, you're not going to put in enough time and enough effort to really move something forward. So, you know, the big, super high level, hairy, audacious goal behind this is to industrialize nutrition or to make to use the industrial food system to make eating well, delicious, convenient, and affordable. Um, and that's, you know, in contradiction to a lot of what's currently out there in terms of like the way to eat well, the way to eat healthy is to always shop at a farmer's market and always cook your own meals. There's a lot of anti-technology sentiments in nutrition right now. And I think that's sad. I think, I think technology can save us from the problems that technology got us into. And so, you know, industrializing nutrition, if I can get that done within 10 years, um, I will have wildly exceeded my highest expectations of what this company could potentially do. So this, this is it. Um, you know, this is what I go to bed, sleep, go to sleep thinking about what I wake up thinking about and what I think about during the night while I'm dreaming right now. And I think that's going to be the same way for another five years. Um, maybe in five years, we'll have made enough progress on this specific problem that I can start thinking about working on other problems again. But um, there's just too much too much to be done here for me to be thinking about something else at this time. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Um, last question or two. Uh, do you sell your products on a subscription basis or is it ones, onesies, twosies, and where can people get the products and try them out? Um, so go to sated.com. That's S-A-T-E-D.com. 
and we make subscriptions available uh, because it reduces the cost that we can sell it at, um, at the same return on capital. So we like to share the benefits um, when we have those. We do have one time available as well, uh, but the subscriptions are cancel any time, change anything you want, has 100% guarantee. And our whole thing there is we're working so hard to take stress out of eating well. We're not going to put stress back into the product by having unfriendly billing practices. Um, when people try it, they love it. And um, so we have so few people take us up on our uh, money back guarantees that we just go out of our way to make it as friendly as possible. Okay, very good. So sated.com is the best place to go. And uh, any other uh, interesting tidbits you want to answer, uh, places you see the keto world going over the next couple of years? Uh, it's just it's going to get easier and easier and easier to be keto over the next couple of years. Um, unlike some of the food trends that have happened in the last 20 years, um, it is legitimately an order of magnitude harder to make keto food than it is to make gluten-free or paleo food. I'm not saying those are easy, but I am saying I'm saying that making a good keto bread is an order of magnitude harder than making a good gluten free bread. So um, so it's going to take a little bit longer for the keto products to make it into the market. But the the people who follow it are so fanatical. It's going to get easier. And um, the only other thing I would say is that if you're going to try keto, you should really try it for at least eight weeks. Um, the first four days are going to suck. They are just really quite miserable, actually, or if not miserable, they're mediocre. Um, after day four, it gets pretty nice and easy. After week four, your body is fat adapted and you can really kind of burn and cruise and get the benefits, um, which is where I suggest people do eight weeks so that they have four weeks during adaptation and then four weeks to know what living a keto lifestyle is like. Hmm. Okay. Well, fair enough. Um, any other, you know, since you don't provide counseling, that's fine. But any any other resources for people to find out more about, uh, you know, how to eat keto and how to fit these foods into what works best for them? Uh, I would say the Reddit Our Keto community is fantastic. Um, there are half a dozen great uh, keto communities on Facebook. I personally like the Ruled.me blog. Um, I like Keto Connect on YouTube. Um, Peter Atia, we discussed before the, um, before this started, um, his blog, I think his blog is one of the best resources on scientific keto that's out there. Um, and, you know, starting with those, you're going to find a ton of great resources and a ton of great information, um, and be well on your way to understanding what this diet really entails and really what this okay. lifestyle entails. Uh, I, I, I go between calling it a diet and a lifestyle, and I think it's really more of a lifestyle than a diet. Well, very good. Well, Ted, thanks for coming on the line. I, I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad that you're working in this area and make it easier for everyone to eat this way. So, uh, so thank you. Uh, likewise, it's been great uh, being on. Thank you for having me. You have been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, post a review to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.